Good morning. I'm Joe Chamberlain, the Executive Director of the Coastside Land Trust. And we are delighted today to present, uh, have, have Dr. Patrick Robinson present a virtual tour of the Año Nuevo Elephant Seal Reserve. He will take us through a walk and uh, help to ask, answer questions that you have. And uh, the, the challenge for Patrick today and for all of us is that the coverage of the reserve is not absolutely perfect. It's a little bit spotty, but you will definitely get the full experience uh, during the uh, presentation by Dr. Robinson. Thank you so much for joining us today, Patrick, and uh, please take tell us what's going on there. Great, oh, thank you so much. And uh, thanks everyone for, uh, for attending today. It's always fun to, to show everyone Ani Nuevo Reserve here. Um, so I've been told that uh, I should probably tell you guys about what these interesting noises are in the background here. So I'm gonna flip my camera around so you can see what I am seeing. Um, I'm actually really close to some seals here. These are the weanling elephant seals. So I'm just born earlier this year and I'm sure that they will be interrupting me regularly throughout the presentation today. So if you, if you hear some strange noises, it's probably them. We'll flip back around here. Uh, so anytime I talk to a group about the, uh, the work that we're doing out here, I do like to start off with just sort of uh, mentioning the place that we're at. And uh, so this is Año Nuevo State Park and also Año Nuevo Reserve. Uh, so it is state park land. And so it's uh, nicely protected land that is open to the public. Um, right now, because of COVID, it's kind of half open and half closed. So the preserve where most of the elephant seals are um, is actually closed for protection um, because of the um, concerns about COVID in the tours. But you can actually still come out and see um, some small number of seals in the Cove Beach area. Um, and then it is a UC natural reserve. So this is a University of California natural reserve site, which is just an incredible designation because that means that we have um, folks like myself who are able to communicate uh, the research findings, help with research, help with teaching, and help with a variety of outreach activities. So it's a really nice partnership that we have between the, the California State Parks and the University of California Natural Reserve System. And there's an absolutely amazing amount of research that goes on here, uh, largely on the elephant seals, but also on a variety of other species. And so um, we'll touch on a lot of that in a little bit. But um, first, I just wanted to welcome everyone to this amazing site. So, um, I'll just start off by showing you guys um, what I'm seeing, uh, a little bit of a more close-up of the weanlings here. And um, over my other shoulder here is the um, little adult female harem. So I'll flip my camera around. And then what I usually do is just sort of um, talk about what's going on right now and then what you could see throughout the year um, at Año Nuevo. What's really neat is that throughout the entire year, you can actually see elephant seals. So um, no matter what time of year you come here, um, there is some demographic um, that's visible, whether it be the juveniles or the adults or the, the young of the year like we're seeing right now. Um, but you guys are really lucky because the, um, the end of the breeding season here is one of the times when you can see just about every age class um, all at once. And there's a really dense grouping of animals. So these right in front of me here are weanlings. <laughs> Very talkative. <laughs> Um, and these guys were born earlier this year, so most of them were born in uh, January, about mid to late January. They nurse from their mothers uh, for about a month, um, almost exactly 27 days. It's um, uh, pretty regular. And then they're weaned when their mothers take off to sea on their post-breeding migration. So all of the, the weanlings that we see here have already been weaned. Their mothers have taken off, and they're basically super depleted because the mothers have been delivering super energy dense milk to their pups for a full month without eating or drinking. And uh, I'm sure that there are at least a few moms in the audience here. So um, I've, I've been told that um, the craving, the food cravings are pretty intense when you're nursing. So imagine fasting for an entire month while nursing your kid. And that's what the female elephant seals here have to deal with. So pretty energetically intensive stuff there. So when they're about ready to take off, they are very hungry and they go out to sea 
forage for um, just over two months before they come back to the molt. Um, but they're leaving these guys, um, these weanlings here on the beach uh, for about two months. So these guys stick around and just live off of their very plentiful fat reserves uh, for about two months. And then they'll take off on their very first trip to sea. And then this is just kind of an amazing feat for them because um, a lot of these weanlings go very far. And they're traveling for months out in the open ocean up along the coastlines, just kind of all over the place. And they will have never been out into the ocean before um, that time and never been diving, never fed before. So they do not get, <laughs> they do not get any sort of parental instruction uh, before that first trip to sea. <laughs> I think that recent wave uh, gave them a lot to talk about over here. Then if I um, flip my camera around the other way, <laughs> We can see in the distance there um, some males and some females, so adult females. So there's a, a large male. And so these guys, um, he's a full adult male, and he has been fighting for his breeding rights throughout the, the season. So probably he arrived in December, and he was um, fighting other males in order to establish a dominance hierarchy. And given his position right there, it doesn't look like he's an alpha male because he's on the outside of the group. So he might be a beta male. And if we were to look a little bit to the right there, oh, there's a male calling a little bit to the right of the house on the island. And I would guess that he's one of the alpha males um, because he's scaring off that other uh, male there. So he's protecting his last remaining breeding rights for the, the little harem that remains there um, that contains both adult females and young pups. And then if I zoom out a little bit more, we have down here is a juvenile seal. So this is about the same size as the weanlings, um, but we can tell that there's a difference in the fur coloration. And so their fur gets kind of yellowish um, as they go to sea for a year, and then they will eventually molt that fur off. Um, and this guy's actually back to molt. So this is a weanling last year been out at sea for a while, probably came back in the in the fall for a little bit, then went to sea again, and then is now back to molt. And so he'll probably be here for about four to six weeks, probably just arrived. And then the molting process is probably going on right now um, uh, below the skin surface. And then the visible molt will start uh, fairly soon. And then that seal will very quickly get a nice brand new silvery coat of fur and look like this weanling seal who's already undergone that first molt um, from the Lanuga. Okay, so that's, um, that's what's going on right now. And then if we continue on in the year, so like next month, if you were to come back to Año Nuevo, you would see actually mostly juvenile seals back to molt. And I, as I said, each of them are back for about four to six weeks. And then shortly thereafter, starting in mid-April, we would start to see a lot of adult females back after their short post-breeding migration of about 70 days. So it's just a kind of a quick out and back for them, relatively speaking, um, a lot shorter than their post-molt migration. And it's basically just a quick, like 1,500 kilometers out to sea and back. And they're traveling continuously, diving continuously, and just trying to build back some of those fat and muscle reserves that they lost during the, um, during the breeding season. So then they come back in mid-April and stick around till late May or early June, um, undergoing that annual molt. And let me switch around my camera here and I actually have a sample of that molt here for you guys to see. Let's see. So it's, it's actually kind of a strange thing that these guys do. Um, it's called a catastrophic molt, and it's not too many marine mammals do that. Um, so when they're molting, they undergo a catastrophic molt, and that means that they shed off basically giant chunks of skin and fur. It's kind of gross if you think about it, but um, this is the kind of stuff that peels off the sides of the field. And so this is a layer of skin and fur. It's I kind of um, it's kind of like a bad sunburn. You know, if you get a really bad sunburn and your skin kind of peels off as it's healing, 
it's kind of like what's going on, except the fur is embedded in that skin. And these, these big chunks just kind of peel right off and that reveals the nice new skin and fur below. And so there's just a few different species of seals that have this catastrophic molt. And so elephant seals, both Northern and Southern, and monk seals, like the Hawaiian monk seal, um, have something similar. But yeah, most animals shed more like your dog or cat. It's kind of individual um, skin cells and fur falling out. Um, you know, slowly over you know, a month or two. And I've been told that um, I should tell you guys about the kind of sensory experience about some of this stuff. So, you know, I wish you guys could hold on to this, but it, it's actually pretty rough. Um, a lot of people ask, you know, why were elephant seals hunted back in the day? And it definitely was not for their fur. This is, is very rough. You would not want to make a fur coat out of this. It's not very dense fur either. Um, kind of hold it up a little bit there. It's just, it's very low quality fur. Um, it feels more like sandpaper than a nice fur coat. Um, and it's kind of a little bit different on both sides. So um, the shorter fur is on the inner side of that and the longer fur is on the outside of it. And then the smell of it is actually very distinctive. It, it doesn't smell bad necessarily, but it, it smells very musty. This is a very distinctive smell. Um, but, but yeah, not, not bad exactly. Um, but during the molt season, the beaches are just littered with this. And one of the things that's kind of fun is that researchers can actually utilize um, this to study the elephant seals in a sort of passive way. So by studying the stable isotopes in the fur of the seals, we can get a better sense about what they're eating and where they're going. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. And one of the other things that the seals do when they're um, back to molt is they shed their whiskers. Um, not necessarily all of the whiskers, but actually the majority of them. And so this is an example of one of those whiskers. And it's a little bit hard to tell, but these are actually really firm. They're, they're very different than dog or cat whiskers that are you know, very thin and easily flexed. Um, this is very, very firm and actually has um, little ridges on it and is sort of flattened in, in one orientation. And so these guys have a whole bed of, of whiskers on them. And, and they can project those outward. And um, if you remind me later, I can tell you a little bit more about that. We have some really exciting research that's been looking at how the elephant seals utilize those whiskers when they forage. And one of the funny things um, about marine mammal whiskers, I don't think this is true with elephant seal whiskers, but um, some marine mammal whiskers, like the fur seal whiskers that are quite long, they actually used to clean opium pipes back a long time ago with these because it was a, a nice long firm uh, tool for that before you had plastics and everything. So all sorts of weird uses for marine mammal parts. Okay, then, um, so we've kind of been going through the year um, of the colony here. And so we're in May and early June, the adult females um, have molted and then they take off to sea on their long post molt migration. And that one is about seven or eight months in duration. And they're at sea continuously during that entire time. So just an amazingly long um, physiological feat um, to be out there for that long. It's incredible. And then if we zoom ahead a little bit in the year to the summer, like midsummer and late summer is when the males come back. So the males and females molt at different times of the year. So they're back at the same time, obviously during the breeding season and at different times to molt. And then the males take off on their post molting migration, obviously a little bit shorter in order to make it back in time for the subsequent breeding season. And then if we zoom ahead a little bit further into the fall, um, that's the juvenile haul-out period. And that's an interesting period because it's sort of a mystery to us why the juveniles haul out. They've already molted earlier in the year, right? In you know, late March, early April. So there's no real reason they need to come back. They're not breeding, they're not molting. Um, so they come back and hang out anywhere between a couple of days to a few weeks. And, and that is just a little bit of a mystery, but most juveniles do that at some point. And it's not necessarily here at Ani Nuevo. They also haul out at a lot of different colonies along the coast. Um, and then zoom ahead a little bit further into the very end of the fall, into the early winter in December. And that's when the big males start returning. And that's when we see some of these big fights because the males are just starting to um, fight over those dominant hierarchies and establishing their ranks in order to maintain breeding rights when the females arrive. And actually to my right here is a, a male that's just uh, come back from a little swim. Um, he's been around for the entire breeding season, not just arriving, but this gives you an idea about the, the size and what these guys look like. So I'll switch my camera around to him. Oh. 
So one of the things that we do out here is um, try to assess the age, the gender, the reproductive success of the elephant seals as we're going around and doing our surveys. And this guy is a great example of uh, an adult male. And we know that because he's a very large body size, very large nose, and he has that chest shield um, that extends um, basically up, up to the level of his eye. So that kind of scarring on his chest. This is like really intense uh, scar tissue that develops after lots and lots of fights. So this guy is, um, he's big and impressive, but he's actually not the most impressive male. Um, so he's a subordinate male this year. Maybe next year or the year after he'll come back and if he's forged successfully and becomes more dominant, he'll be able to maintain a harem of his own. Um, but he's just trying to um, take advantage of any last remaining mating opportunities during the breeding season here. Oh, couldn't have asked for a better timing for that call there. <laughs> so he actually was doing that call to chase away another male who was getting a little bit too close. So um, that was actually a really fun interaction that you guys just saw. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about the behavioral studies that are going on a little bit later, but um, couldn't pass up the opportunity to show you that. So that was a great example of an acoustic display. So that male was calling in order to show his dominance over the other male. And the other male was less dominant, you know, inferior. So he did the appropriate thing and started to kind of meander away from the more dominant male to avoid a direct interaction. And so that's what we see a lot of times out here with the male-male interactions. A lot of people are very familiar with the big epic fights of these guys, and those are certainly spectacular, but um, most of the interactions between males are not fights. Um, most of them are just these basically you know, looks or acoustic displays or even just a, a brief body movement toward another male. They certainly don't want to engage in fights all the time. That would be very energetically taxing. Let me switch my camera back around here. Okay, so that's sort of the, the year in the life of the colony here. And I do usually like to talk about the history of the, the elephant seal population before I talk about some of the research that we do, um, just to kind of put everything in context. So elephant seals have a, a really interesting history. Um, and it's one that is really quite tragic, but also is amazing in terms of their recovery. So. Elephant seals, like a lot of marine mammals, were hunted by humans uh, for many years. And we were actually really efficient at hunting, hunting them. So you can see how I'm sitting very close to elephant seals right now, and they basically don't really care too much that I'm sitting here. And that unfortunately makes them very easy to hunt. And so hunters back in the 1800s and early 1900s um, would take elephant seals largely for their blubber layers. And this is before the era of petroleum was, uh, was really um, going in full force. So, you know, like blubber from whales and seals um, was a very important product for lots of different um, applications, everything from lamp oil to, um, I think I saw an advertisement for harness oil, um, just all sorts of different lubrication products for machinery. It's, it's everything that we use petroleum for now, um, they had to find different um, uh, substances for and, and blubber was one of those substances so they would render down the fats in the blubber layer for those. So elephant seals were, were very easy to, to hunt just laying on the beaches here and so hunters could come in and take literally every animal at a colony uh, in very short time and so they did that and we completely wiped out all of the elephant seals along the west coast of the United States and down in Mexico they pretty much did the same thing almost all of the elephant seals were wiped out down there and it was just a tiny little island, um, Guadalupe Island, off of the Baja Peninsula down in Mexico, that there was a tiny little population of elephant seals. And uh, I've been told that the main reason that they didn't kill every last one there was because it was just kind of hard to access. You know, there was no kind of conservation mindset or anything like that. It was just, it wasn't worth their time to go and kill those last remaining elephant seals. Interestingly, the, um, there were some research groups at the time that found out about this um, last remaining group of elephant seals. 
and they went down on an expedition to um, to see if they could find these last elephant seals, kind of the last of the species in existence. And of course, today, if there was an expedition like that, we would capture the animals and get, get them into captivity and start a breeding program and, and try to rescue them from extinction. Um, but this is a very different era back then. And they basically just wanted to collect specimens um, for scientific research and, and museums. And so they found some, I believe it was seven or nine individuals, and they ended up killing most of them in order to bring them back to museums and you know, properly preserve them just sort of the, the last remnants of a, a species that is extinct. So fortunately, they were not successful in killing all of them, and there were probably some out at sea, um, but there were probably a very, very small number. Some recent genetic work that's been done has estimated the population size at that point to be about 20 individuals, you know, as small as 20 individuals. So elephant seals really should have been extinct. That is not a large enough population to have a good chance of surviving in the long term. But fortunately, the Mexican government protected them. And then much, much later, the US government protected them and they were able to rebound. So we basically stopped hunting them and they naturally rebounded just based on their natural uh, growth rate. And what's interesting is that they're actually a textbook example of exponential population recovery. So if, if you look at the rate at which they increase after that population bottleneck, it is just rapidly expanding and it continues to expand to this day. So from that original population down on Guadalupe Island in Mexico um, of about 20 individuals, it has expanded rapidly to about 220,000 individuals in today's population. So just absolutely incredible. And what's really neat is that with the amount of research going on now at different colonies, we're able to see how the animals are expanding to different colonies. So we have the bulk of the population in the Southern California Channel Islands. So like San Nicolas Island, Santa Rosa Island, uh, for example, and then still some down in Mexico, though that's not the major area. And then there are other areas like Año Nuevo and Point Piedras Blancas and other colonies even a little bit further north of here that, um, that are important areas. And they continue to expand northward. Um, just recently, within the past five to seven years, there's a colony along the Lost Coast that formed. And, and that's growing and females are producing pups. And we even had one pup born on Vancouver Island in Canada. So um, one of the big questions I've always had is um, these elephant seals go really, really far on their foraging migrations, um, some near Alaska. And it seems like a great place for them to haul out and breed and molt up there. So and if I had to put my money on it, I would say in a couple hundred years, you might expect to see elephant seals breeding and molting up in Alaska on the Aleutian Islands. So uh, we'll see if that prediction comes true. Okay, so that's um, sort of the, the basics there. Um, that might be a good point to pause for some questions. I see in the Q&A there, we have a bunch. So, um, Kate, if you wanted to relay any questions to me, then I'd be happy to address those. All right, thanks, Patrick. Um, we got a number of questions about the molting in the fur. Um, what, the first question was why? What, what's the purpose of the molting? Yeah, so that's certainly a great question. So thanks for asking that. Um, so just like you and I actually molt as well, um, we just shed our skin cells and individual hairs just sort of slowly. Um, I'm sure that um, everyone here hates dusting their house. Uh, dust is actually largely human skin cells that we're shedding off slowly. And so um, we just sort of have a, a different way of doing that. So as, as our skin is slowly damaged, um, we shed off those cells and then regrow new cells continuously. Um, the elephant seals have a different strategy. Rather than doing that continuously, they do that all at once. So they accumulate damage throughout the year and then shed their outer layer of skin and fur all at once. And so probably it's about the same amount of material that ends up coming off um, for them versus us, you know, for every square centimeter, um, you know, of skin there. Um, but they just do it all at once. And so a lot of people ask, well, you know, why, why would you do that? Like, why all at once? Why not just continuously replace like we do? Um, and we think that what's going on there is that when the animals are out at sea, which is where they spend most of their time, in order to replace their skin and fur, they would have to send a large amount of blood from the inside of their body out to their skin and bypass their blubber layer. And so they certainly could do that. Um, you know, they have the physiology to do that. They do that on land. But if they did that when they were in the water, they would lose a lot of heat. And that would basically be negating their blubber layer, which they use to stay warm out there. 
and that would end up costing them a lot of energy and they would need to feed a lot more. So probably it's an energy saving thing. And so they basically accumulate all that damage when they're out at sea and then come back and haul out and bask in the nice sun like today. And, and then they're not losing that energy that they would be losing out at sea in order to replace all of that skin and fur. Um, so yeah, great question. And someone else was asking about that too. Does that does their fur help to keep them warm, or is it entirely the blubber? Is it more of a la layer of protection, or is it? Yeah. So, um, elephant seals are an, an example of a species that does not use their fur at all for warmth. So, yeah, it's a, a little bit hard to see in the, in the fur that I showed you, but it is not dense at all. Water absolutely penetrates that immediately, and then they get wet down to the skin. And so this is not anything like a fur seal or a sea otter that um, traps a layer of air between um, the fur and the skin. And in fact, um, some of those other species like sea otters and fur seals have two different layers of fur. So they have the undercoat and then the guard hairs. And you know, they have to maintain um, that layer of air and they have oils that come out. And it's, just, it's basically a very arduous process to maintain their coats. And that's one of the reasons why people hunt them them was because they had such fine um, fluffy fur coats and so yeah, elephant seals don't do that at all they rely completely on their blubber layer for warmth and, and not at all on that um, that layer of, of uh, fur uh, on the surface there probably it does provide some abrasion protection and I, I don't know this for sure but I think it might actually help with hydrodynamics as well it, it sets very um, it sets down when the animals are wet um, very um, firmly against the skin and I think it might actually help uh, create a very smooth surface and help them glide through the water a little bit more. But um, we haven't actually done any studies on that. So we'll have to um, find a, a, a scientist that specializes in hydrodynamics to study that for us. So, someone else, else, I think, was hoping for the sensory experience. So they were wondering about like that, the molted skin. Uh, uh, is it leathery? Is it brittle? Is it crumbly? They were looking for a little bit of a description. Yeah, so um, I have a piece of it here. So it's it's very thin. So you know, it's just it's wobbly. Um, it's actually not very strong. So see if I can do this with one hand here. Um, I can actually just tear it um, very easily. So it, it's not very strong. Um, you wouldn't want to like use this for any like making gloves or you know anything like that. Um, so it's really not very functional. Um, Really, it's just good to show people what the molt looks like. Um, it cannot really be used for anything other than than research. So I think the seals are, are very good at not um, removing a layer that's too thick. Um, so there's a very thin layer of skin and the outer layer of fur. So um, yeah, hopefully that gives you a little bit of better sense for, for what that's like. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and we have a number of people that are asking, they want to see more pictures of the seals as we go. And I know that Patrick, we've talked that that's going to be happening as we go. Sort of this is happening in a few stages and we're actually going to take a little walk to look. Um, I'm, can I ask you just a couple more questions before we keep moving forward? Sure, yeah. I'll, okay. I'll make sure the seals are in my background to, to keep those people happy. <laughs> oh, okay. Awesome. Um, so the, uh, do seals vocalize differently at different ages? Oh, yeah. That's a really good question. Um, so. So yes, um, and that's something that is an active study going on right now. Um, so if you go to the youngest ages, so when the pups and, and mothers are interacting, the pups do have a very distinctive call. And it's, uh, you, I don't know, you might be able to hear it in the background, uh, <laughs> sort of like a, a squawk or a little bit of a scream. You know, if you come out here, um, you, you almost think that an animal is being tortured because it sounds like it's someone screaming. It's kind of horrible until you realize that it's just a happy little pup playing around. Um, but they do have um, that very distinctive squawk that they make. And it's, it sounds very similar between different pups, but uh, mothers, we think, have some ability to differentiate the, the calls of different pups, although they're, they're actually quite bad at it. So when especially a young mother hears a pup calling, a lot of times she's not sure if it's her pup or her neighbor's pup. And so she can get confused and kind of go over to it and call at it and think that it's hers and cause a little interaction between her and the neighboring female. And then they sort things out and then she realizes that her pup is actually on her other side and then they go back to business as usual. But um, just sort of lots of funny little interactions like that. Um, and then the females um, have basically two different calls that they make. One is sort of an aggressive call, and so they um, they use that 
to each other. Um, so, you know, if, if they get bit or, you know, or engage in one of those little interactions between females, it's sort of a growl, kind of a, a grunting growl noise. Uh, I would try to do it, but I, I don't do it justice at all. <laughs> um, and then the other noise that the moms make is sort of similar to the pups noise. It's kind of a squawk or a chirp. Um, and then they do that to kind of get the pup's attention and then the, the mother and pup can interact vocally like that. And then um, the, the mothers basically just have those two vocalizations and, and that's it. Um, in addition to the sneezes and other <laughs> kind of um, basic physiology noise that they make. Um, but the males are, are very interesting because they're slowly developing their calls that they use um, as distinctive uh, calls to establish their dominance hierarchies and, and interact with other big males. And that's something that um, researchers at UC Santa Cruz are working on right now. And so um, Dr. Colleen Reichmuth uh, runs the Sensory uh, Cognition Lab uh, down at UC Santa Cruz, a long marine lab. And she works with Dr. Carolyn Casey. And together, they do a lot of vocalization research um, up here at Ani Nuevo. And it's really neat stuff. Um, I'm sure we can pass along some of the links to some papers and some um, popular articles about that work, but it's, it's really neat stuff. And so basically what they've learned is that each of the males has a fairly unique call. Um, to my ears, they sound very similar. It's all kind of like a pulsatile like, pop, 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 pop type of noise. Um, but if they analyze them with like little spectrum analyzers on their computer, they can differentiate individuals and then use those recordings to play back the recordings to other males. And then they can also do observations to try to figure out which male is dominant to which other male. And then they can play back the call of a dominant male to a subordinate male. And as you might expect, if you play a dominant call to a subordinate male, the, the subordinate male runs away in fear. Even if that uh, more dominant male isn't physically present, just the sound of him is present. And so they've been able to do a bunch of playback experiments like that to basically validate the use of these calls um, in their social interactions. And so they've shown that very, very nicely through some carefully controlled experiments and it's just a very nice, clean study. And then uh, Dr. Carolyn Casey has been continuing that research and, and she's currently investigating how those vocalizations develop through time and if they're consistent through time. So in order to do that, she has to um, basically uniquely identify lots of young males and then follow them as they develop vocally through the years. And unfortunately, these males have um, actually a very high mortality rate. So she has to learn a lot and do a lot of recordings um, from many individual males that are young in order to hopefully um, be able to study some of them later on in life when they become alpha males you know, and are the most dominant. Um, so we'll have to stay tuned for some of that research because it's definitely underway. Um, but yeah, so those are some of the, the vocalizations that the seals are making. Awesome. Um, a couple questions about this, about how babies are, how are they learning to swim if they're, if they're having to do it, go it alone? And, and then also another question sort of piggyback that is how are they learning to rest and sleep out at sea for, you know, when they're out at sea for many months? Yeah, so two great questions. And, um, I'm fortunate that um, my wife is actually also an elephant seal researcher and studying the weanlings and, and their behavior is actually um, one of her research projects. So um, because of that, I know a lot about that. <laughs> um, so um, she's looking at these weanlings, um, both when they're on land before they venture into the sea for the first time and on that very first foraging migration. So uh, Roxanne Beltran is a professor at UC Santa Cruz and, and this is one of her um, research projects that, that she's getting funded. and we're learning some really interesting things. And I should point out that um, historically, this would be a very logical thing to study. So a lot of people ask, why haven't you studied this before? And it's actually because the weanlings have a very high mortality rate. So if we put an expensive instrument on seals and we don't get it back, then we lose a bunch of data and we lose the ability to use that tag again. So a lot of the research that we've done is on adult females because they're very reliable. But you know, we've done a lot of that and we know a lot about adult females and, and now it's time to start branching out into these other age and sex classes. And so the weanlings are a very interesting demographic to study because that's a, it's really a kind of a crunch time. Um, it's, it's make it or break it. These young animals um, are often doing very well after feeding from their mother for a month, 
so they're in great body condition, but they're then abandoned by their mother and, and left to forage for themselves. And they're completely dependent on their own ability over that first year to survive. And they need to be able to forage successfully. So, so yeah, how do these guys explore the water for the first time? A lot of these animals, a lot of these weanlings have never been in the water when their mothers take off to sea. So they have to explore the ocean all on their own. And we actually just finished up a collaboration with the BBC and they developed some um, cameras for us, kind of like critter cams. Um, and we put those last year on some weanlings and that enabled us to see what these guys were seeing and how often they were going to the water and what they were doing in the water uh, before they take off on their first migration. And early on in that um, post weaning fast, the seals are largely just on the beach, um, just sleeping, resting, interacting with each other, moving around and just trying to stay out of the way of the females and males that are still interacting for the breeding season. Um, but soon after, um, right about now, they're starting to venture into the water a little bit more. And we didn't know how far they went or how deep they're diving during um, these little exploration visits. Um, but it turns out they're not going very far or deep. They're just playing around in the shallows here. So probably the very farthest they go is maybe halfway out to Aninovo Island. And it's all very shallow, rocky reef around here. So, um, you know, they're certainly not doing these epic dives or long migrations that the, you know, the adult animals are doing. They're just kind of playing around. And then when they eventually take off on their first migration, um, they really just decide to leave one day and then they are off. And we don't have very much data from those um, first migrations, but the little bit that we do have shows that almost right away, they are doing amazing dives and traveling really far. So we have examples of some weanling seals that on their very first trip to sea travel almost all the way to the Aleutian Islands and back, just incredible distances. Some stay much more local. We have um, many of them that are diving down to upwards of 300 or 400 meters almost right away. So these are just incredible depths that, I mean, as a scuba diver, you might go down to 30 meters. These guys are on their very first few dives are able to dive down to 10 times that depth. Just absolutely amazing. And then it just takes a few months for them to be able to dive down to about the average dive depth of the adult females, which is you know, between 500 and 650 meters. So these guys on their very first trip to sea when their body size is still quite small are just incredible divers. So that gives us um, even more evidence that the adult females who are much larger and have an additional capacity for diving are really not even testing themselves on their average dives. It's, it's a walk in the park for them. These guys are built for diving. So yeah, these, these weanling seals that we see on the beach here, um, they look like they're just lounging around and, and not doing much, but um, they're just absolute diving athletes, um, even right now. So it's neat to see. Awesome. Lots more questions, but we'll let you keep going and we'll, we'll wait for our next break and get to a good number of these. Okay. Thank you, Patrick. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, so um, now that we've kind of covered the, the year in the life of the elephant seal and with those questions, I think we're kind of dipping into some of the different research projects that are going on. So that's a great segue to talk about um, some of the work that we're doing out of UC Santa Cruz and some of the neighboring universities that, that are in the Bay Area here. Um, so I'll, I'll give credit to Dr. Bernie LaBeouf, um, who is the researcher who, from UC Santa Cruz who really started the elephant seal research program out here. And then subsequent to that, uh, Dr. Dan Costa, who's a current professor at UC Santa Cruz. Um, those two were really the, the researchers that headed up a lot of the different projects going on out here and kept it going for literally decades, which is pretty amazing. So if we zoom back in time to the late 60s and early 70s, that's just when the adult female elephant seals were starting to breed on the mainland here. Um, Dr. Bernie LaBeouf had the foresight to start a flipper tagging program, just a basic demographic program to start studying the animals. And so this is very, very low tech stuff, but you can do some really neat analyses to study um, the population. And so one of the things that he was doing is putting out flipper tags. And so here's an example um, of a flipper tag. Let's take it out of the tagging shears there. So, a little flipper tag is basically the same thing as a cattle ear tag that you know ranchers keep track of their cows with. So this consists of a piece of plastic with a spike and a piece of plastic with a unique number on it. And then we basically put that um, using some tagging shears here into the rear flipper of the seal. 
So um, as you might imagine, the rear uh, flipper is kind of like your hand and it has webbing between the different digits. And we can basically just put that flipper tag in the webbing of the rear flipper. And that stays um, throughout their entire life. Uh, a lot of people ask, you know, is that painful? And the answer is probably for a moment. Um, but it, what makes me feel a lot better about that is that um, when we do that, they certainly will react, but oftentimes we come back one or two minutes later and the animals are doing their normal behavior and even falling asleep again. So I think it maybe hurts a little bit, but then doesn't hurt after that and they just go back to the normal business. So um, very, not very invasive research technique to really gain a much better understanding um, of this population. So it's basically the method that we use to identify and keep track of individuals. So that unique number um, when recited across many years allows us to ask questions like, how long do individuals live? How often do they come back to this colony versus other colonies? How often does an individual female give birth? How many times does she give birth in her lifetime? Um, you know, is this, the, is this alpha male the same alpha male from last year or is it a different one? Um, do they come back to the same individual beaches within this site or not? Um, so just lots and lots of questions can be addressed using those um, flipper tags. And we put them out in the weanlings. So after they've been weaned from their mother, um, during that two month post weaning fast, we go around and put those flipper tags in and um, from a subset of the animals, we also uh, weigh them and measure them in order to get a, a better understanding of how they're starting off in life. And that enables us to answer questions like, um, how fat does a weanling need to be in order to have a good chance of surviving to the next year? Uh, we see a lot of um, sad things out here, like some pups don't get enough milk from their mothers and you know, they end up pretty skinny. And you know, we, we wanna know how skinny is too skinny to survive that first year of life? Or in some cases, how fat is too fat? You know, some of these pups are nursing off of more than one mother. And so it might be bad to be too fat because they're too buoyant. And so we can begin to address questions like that. Um, and again, a lot of that is just because we're putting in these little flipper tags and keeping track of those. And at, at last count, I think we were up to about 53,000 elephant seals that, that we put little flipper tags in across the multi-decadal study that we've been working on. So just an amazing amount of research there. And if we look around to other marine mammal studies around the world, um, this is actually a pretty unique opportunity that we've had here to study um, this population since its founding. Um, most researchers who begin a, a project start off with a colony that is already in existence, and they sort of start um, studying that even though the colony has had a long history. And so to study a colony from the start of the colony is a very unique opportunity. And we, in, we tag about um, 300 of the pups every year, and there are about 2,000 of them that are born every year. So it's certainly not every pup that we attach one of these tags to. That would actually make too much work for us to go around and recite all of those. Um, but it's a substantial portion of the population. It allows us to address all of those um, demographic questions. So then um, in addition to putting out those flipper tags, um, what we're doing throughout the year is trying to find the flipper tags and record those data. So um, most of the time when I'm out here and other researchers are out here, um, we're carrying around um, little data books like this and recording the area, the tag and position and the sex and the age and the percent molt and whether a female has a pup, um, all sorts of information about individuals that we recite. And so we're just going around um, the colony with binoculars and cameras trying to read those flipper tags in order to document the presence of individual seals. And so you know, we put out flipper tags during this time of year in the weanlings, and then we try to find those same animals um, in the fall when they come back for their annual haul out. And, you know, as they get older during the breeding season and molting seasons. And so, yeah, there's a lot of what we're doing out here is just relocating those same animals and recording those flipper tags when we observe them. But as you can imagine, um, these little flipper tags are actually pretty hard to see, especially when they're in a large group of animals and the theme, the, the animals are flipping sand on themselves and they kind of close up their flippers and hide their tags. So we have to come up with some clever tricks to um, basically identify these unique individuals and tell us if they have flipper tags. So one of our tricks is to utilize hair dye. <laughs> um, so it's kind of a funny thing. We use Clairol hair dye, the same kind you can buy at Safeway. And we, whenever we find a seal that has a flipper tag, then we record that. And then if the seal is accessible to us, we have a little stamping pad and we mix up some hair dye. 
we write the tag number on that stamping pad and quickly run up and stamp that number on the side of the seal. And it basically just dyes the fur of the seal with the same number as their flipper tag. And that's a really neat study technique because that allows us to observe who the animal is with that unique identity without needing to get very close to it. So then all of the observations of that animal in the future until the next annual molt um, can be done just with binoculars from a distance without disturbing that animal at all. So we end up spending a lot of our time looking for flipper tags, putting out those die marks, and then just observing the animals from a distance. And, and that's been the main focus of the research for a long period of time, ever since the, um, the late, 50, uh, late 60s and early 70s. Um, and then, so that demographic project is probably the single um, largest and long-term project that's been going on. And then more recently, um, Dan Costa and other colleagues have been interested in what the animals do out at sea. And so we, they've been noticing for a long time that the elephant seals go to sea for these extended periods of time. And um, until we had more advanced technologies beyond these little flipper tags, we really had no idea where they went or how deep they were diving or how they were forging successfully. So it really wasn't until the late 90s that some um, satellite tagging technology and time depth recorder technology um, came into the market and we were able to study these things. Um, so I'll show you one um, instrument here that was really kind of the one of the first time depth recorders that was used to study elephant seals out at sea. And so um, this right here is a mechanical time depth recorder. So it's basically a, a giant metal tube with some uh, mechanical stuff inside and, and a big battery. And if I show you the, the inside of that, so it's basically a, a pressure transducer on the end there um, with a little tube that goes down. And at the very end there, now this is inside the tag, there's a little um, bar that goes back and forth. And that has a little light emitting diode on it. And this is photographic film. So the photographic film slowly unwinds around these dials. And then as the animal dives, this little arm moves back and forth to indicate how deep the animal is going. So essentially, it's drawing the dive behavior of the animal with light on photographic film. So these things would last you know, a couple of weeks, two or three weeks, as this film slowly, slowly moved around those reels. And this would be on the back of a seal, and it would slowly record the diving behavior um, of a seal over that time period. And then researchers would get these tags back and they'd have to um, process the photographic film and then blow them up into, uh, onto paper. And then it was the job of undergraduate assistants to go in and measure them to figure out how long each of the dives were and how deep each of the dives were. And that's how we got the first information about diving. And what was really incredible is that we really had no idea how deep the animals were going and how long they were diving. We just kind of assumed beforehand that Elephant seals were kind of like harbor seals. So kind of very coastal and not super deep diving. And so when they got back these records, they were astounded at a couple of features. So one is that they were continuously diving. So just continuously, literally like two minutes at the surface and then 23 minutes underwater and two minutes at the surface and 23 minutes underwater for weeks on end, like day and night, just absolutely incredible. And then the depths of the dives were also amazing. So from these time depth recorders, they were able to show that the average dive depth of these animals is between 450 and 650 meters down, so just super, super deep. And then the deepest dives are upwards of more than a mile down, so over 1,750 meters. It's absolutely incredible. The average dive duration is about 23 minutes, both for adult males and adult females. Um, but the adult females, because they're diving because they are diving deeper in the pelagic areas, not in the coast like the males, they have the opportunity to stay down a lot longer in order to get to those deep depths. So the longest dive we've been able to record is just shy of two hours. So um, I believe it's 116 minutes. So the, I always joke that the next time you guys watch a, a full length movie on Netflix, um, take a giant breath during the entire thing and see how long you can hold your breath, see if you can make it to the end of the movie, because an elephant seal can. <laughs> um, so, that's sort of what we've learned from those um, basic time depth recorders. 
And then more recently, um, as you might imagine, as technology has advanced and microprocessors um, got smaller and more energy um, efficient, um, they were able to develop electronic tags. And so here's an example of an electronic time depth recorder. This is a Mark 9 model from Wildlife Computers. So rather than having the super, super custom built tag that you know, is not built by a company, it's like built by researchers fabricating parts themselves. Um, this one is actually made by a commercial company, Wildlife Computers, that you can just order online. Um, and then this records light level with that little light square right there, uh, pressure, which can be used to record depths. And then at the tip here, a fast response um, temperature probe, that little thing sticking up in the middle there is protected by that metal covering. So this little tag um, with that battery, the processor and the sensors and memory chip can record the diving behavior of an animal for a full year, um, just all on that one battery and, and memory chip in there. So just absolutely amazing. And if we actually use the light level data coming off of that tag, we can create a track of that animal as well. And so if you think back to the way that old sailors, like back hundreds of years ago, used to navigate the world's oceans, um, if they had a very accurate clock and compass and looked at the time of day and um, you know, how long sunrise, and, or how long the days were and the timing of local sunrise and sunset, they could figure out where on the planet they were. And from those tags, we can actually do the same thing. Um, but it's not super accurate to do that. So it's like plus or minus one degree of latitude and longitude. So um, researchers really wanted to figure out a, a better way of getting more accurate tracking data. And so um, they started using a, a project called Argos, um, which is a company called CLS America. And they're utilizing satellite tags. So um, these companies have orbiting satellites and they have sensors on them that pick up um, signals from tags like this. So this is an Argos tag. It has a long antenna on the top there that every time the animal comes up to the surface, it transmits. And hopefully if a satellite is overhead, a, a satellite will pick up that signal. And if a couple of those signals are received, then it can basically triangulate the position of the animal in real time for us. And this is a huge advance because the location accuracy was a lot better and the um, ability for us to get tracks in real time was possible. So we can just log on to that website and get the real time position of our seals out at sea to know if they're back at Ani Nuevo or back at a different colony. And we need to go back and recover the instruments down there. This particular tag is a really nice one because it has additional sensors as well. This is a sea mammal research unit tag from St. Andrews, Scotland. We have a nice collaboration with that university. And it has a pressure sensor on the back here, a temperature sensor on the front, and a conductivity cell on the top there. And so these sensors allow us to not only study the diving and movement behavior of the seals, but also the physical oceanography of the ocean environment. And that was just a really, really neat thing to record both of those simultaneously because the first thing we want to do when we study where the animals go to feed is we want to know why the animals are going there to feed. And so if we can study the physical oceanography of the ocean and the biological oceanography, then we can understand more about what makes those areas productive and what makes those good foraging areas for the elephant seals. Um, so those are just a, a few of the different types of tags that we're putting out. Um, I don't have examples of the other ones in front of me here, but just a couple of other examples. Um, we work with our Japanese collaborators from the University of Tokyo and the um, National Institute of Polar Research, also in Tokyo. Um, they've developed these really amazing little um, tags. I kind of call them Fitbits for elephant seals. Um, we attach those to the lower jaw of the seals and it records every time the animal opens and closes its mouth. And if we pair that with the diving data, we know exactly when in the dive an animal is feeding and how often they're feeding, which is really useful information. And from those calculations and, and data, we've been able to... <laughs> got a male interrupting me in, in right here, so I'll switch my camera around so you can see that. <laughs> so this guy was um, scaring off a subordinate male and then got too close to a more dominant male and then got scared off by him. So 
he was both dominant and subordinate in, in that one interaction. So that was kind of fun. <laughs> I'm constantly interrupted by all the craziness going on out here. <laughs> um, so I was mentioning those little Fitbits for elephant seals. So um, they like to call them kami kami tags, which uh, I don't speak Japanese, but I'm told means bite bite in, in Japanese to, to measure the boarding behavior. So um, from those data, we've been able to show that elephant seals, at least the females, are feeding on many, many small prey items. And so they're not going after big individual prey items. Um, but they're going after um, lots and lots of little prey items. So I kind of think of elephant seals, at least the females, as little snackers. So they don't have big gourmet meals. They're just snacking all day on, on little popcorn. Um, and so maybe eating as many as 20 or 30 individual little mctophid um, fish, or little lantern fishes, for example. Um, and another thing that um, these same researchers have developed are um, little cameras. And Rather than using something like a GoPro, which just records um, everything that we would see, um, they make special cameras that are designed to turn on and off um, depending on the depth and activity level of the animal. And they have a delay on them to wait until the animals are way out um, several weeks into their foraging migration out into the depths of the ocean. Um, and so from those tags, we've been able to learn that the seals are eating largely mctophid fish or lantern fishes and uh, deep sea smelts and a whole variety of um, deep sea squids. But um, the adult females are going after just lots and lots of these little tiny fish and squid. So that was really neat to discover. And in Dan Costa's lab, um, in parallel to that research, there was a study of the um, blubber fatty acid. So if you take a blubber sample from an animal, um, it's the you are what you eat phenomenon. You can study the composition of the fats in there and match those up with potential prey items and figure it out. And, and basically those, those two data sources matched. And so that was very nice. So the, the physiology of the animals and the, um, the tagging data matched to show us what they were eating. Um, another example of a type of tag that um, is being put out to study these seals is um, a tag that studies their diving behavior in a slightly different way. So we can attach a specially designed tag that records the acceleration and movement of an animal and then transmits that data in real time so that we understand the body composition of an animal all throughout its migration. And so we can figure out how fat an animal is getting on a day-to-day -day basis um, just from this tag. So really, really neat stuff. And so we're able to get on a very, very fine time scale how successful an animal is when it's foraging and, and what it's doing out there and the physical oceanography of the area. So we're, we're learning lots and lots about what these animals are doing out at sea. And a lot of what we know is on the adult females because they're relatively easy to study and very reliable for us. And we're slowly venturing into studying some of these things in the adult males and in the younger animals as well. But it's gonna take a, a long time before we risk enough instruments on those more uh, risky demographic classes before we have a full understanding of that. Um, yeah, so that's a, a quick summary of some of the, the research that's going on. I guess I should mention that um, when we're putting out some of these instruments, we do have a variety of other researchers that are coming in, and we always try to maximize the um, amount of information that we learn whenever we handle an animal. So we're very concerned about the, the ethics and, and, and morals that go into the, the research that we do. And so one of the ways that we um, think about that is by minimizing the total number of animals that are worked on. So we have these um, big meetings every year amongst all of the different researchers, and we basically collaborate as much as possible. And so when we chemically immobilize a seal to attach instrumentation, we have upwards of 10 different projects that are all utilizing different measurements and samples and tag data from that individual seal so that we don't have to work on 10 different seals to get those same uh, data back. So we might have um, from one seal, we might have um, a couple different types of tag data. So a satellite track, time depth recorder um, data, for example. We might um, take a you know, clip of one of the whiskers for a stable isotope analysis to try to um, look at their diet and, and movement from that. Um, we might have someone taking a flipper punch, so just a tiny little DNA sample in order to better understand the genetic diversity of the seals and, and how that's developing past their bottleneck. Um, we also can take a tiny little bit of muscle or blubber with a little biopsy punch. And that allows us to look at things like the oxygen storage capacity of the muscle. 
um, we can do the fatty acid analysis for the um, for the diet analysis that I was mentioning earlier. Um, we also have some researchers who are taking um, the cells from the, the blubber or the muscle and flash freezing them on liquid nitrogen right away and starting cell lines with those. And what they're able to do is starting start growing elephant seal tissue in order to do experiments that would not be appropriate to do on real wild animals. So things like exposure to certain contaminants. And so, you know, when we think about our impact on uh, the animals out in the ocean, including elephant seals, you know, we're putting a lot of chemicals out in, into the water, DDTs and PCBs and, you know, different flame retardants and um, different chemicals. And, and those have an impact on, on marine life, but we don't necessarily know the full impact of those because we can't do these sorts of crazy experiments that, you know, from a purely scientific perspective, you'd want to do like dose the animal with a large dose of PCBs and see what happens if that affects its reproduction. That wouldn't be appropriate to do. So if you can grow a cell line and expose those cells to these chemicals and see how those cells respond and, and, um, and look at their response at that time scale, then we can have an idea about how they will respond at the, the organism level. And so um, in addition to that, we can just use the samples themselves to look for the contaminant loading of the animals. So you guys may have heard that, you know, it's not good to eat tuna all the time because of the mercury levels um, probably put into the water by coal-fired power plants um, that you know, have the off-gas uh, mercury and other contaminants into the ocean that settles out and eventually accumulates in the food web. Um, the same is true with a lot of other uh, chemicals as well, but if we collect samples from the animals and process those, um, we have a researcher um, who is a former graduate student at UC Santa Cruz who is now going on to work at the USGS, um, but she still collaborates with us. And um, for her PhD, she worked on contaminants in elephant seals, and she's continuing that work um, to help monitor um, the exposure of elephant seals and other critters um, to these harmful chemicals. So these are just a few of the different examples of research studies um, that are going on that, that help us understand not only the elephant seals, but also our impact on, on marine life in general. So, so these guys can tell us an awful lot about what's going on out in the ocean. Uh, cool, so that's a, a nice little summary of the, the research that's going on. Um, do you guys have any questions? Awesome. This is, there's so much information you're sharing. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to keep this short question, this, this uh, question spot quick because I have a lot of people chomping at chomp at the bit to see more elephant seals. Um, so, but a number of questions about the prey, you talked about tiny prey and someone was asking about the pelagic squid. Is that still their um, primary food? Just what is the primary prey sort for elephant seals? Yeah, so uh, I'll qualify what I'm saying um, that we know most about the adult females and, and very little actually about the weanlings and the um, adult males. So. Um, we still have a lot of work to do to figure out um, what those other um, demographics are, are feeding on. But um, with the adult females that are um, going out into the middle of the Northeast Pacific um, and diving continuously, we have several lines of evidence. So those cameras, both video and still, and the stable isotope analysis and the fatty acid analysis, basically all pointing towards um, mostly a fish-based diet. And uh, so they're very opportunistic. So they'll basically eat any fish or squid in front of them, but the majority of what's out there is lantern fishes, um, so mctophid fish. And so if you guys are finding Nemo fans, um, these are the ones that have little photophores along the side of them, um, so they actually light up a little bit. Um, and so that's probably their single largest prey resource. And then the deep sea smelts, and then a whole variety of other species. Um, and then certainly squid is an important component, although not a major component. But again, like relatively small squid, not not like the Pacific squid um, that we see washing up on the shore here um, on occasion. Um, certainly, uh, there are exceptions to that. I'm sure that some of the females will take larger prey if presented um, with them. But um, the bulk of their diet is just going after um, many, many small prey items, and um, and that's been confirmed with the jaw acceleration loggers. Um, just lots and lots of individual um, prey uh, capture events and we see a big difference with other species. So something like a, you know, a California sea lion or, or other species that can take larger species, like a you know, large salmon. Um, so a California sea lion, big male that captures an adult salmon, 
um, we'll bring that up to the surface and kill it and thrash it around and you know consume it in many many bites and you know it basically requires a lot of processing um, in order to get all of the meat off of off of that salmon and and we don't see that at all with the, the female elephant seals they basically just um, use suction to suction in individual fish or squid, swallow them whole, and then immediately move on to trying to find the next small prey item. And um, there was a graduate student um, who actually just finished up, um, uh, Dr. Sarah Keenly, and uh, one of her focuses um, during her um, time here as a PhD student was looking at exactly how animals feed. And she was able to use um, some captive animals um, in order to study um, exactly how these seals get the fish into their mouth, um, which sounds like a very obvious thing to study, but there's actually a couple different ways to do that. Um, and one of them is to bite and grab a prey item and then kind of manipulate it and, and pull it into their mouth. And another is just to use suction. And so if you have a, an amazing ability to kind of pull water into your mouth very quickly by opening um, the your back of your throat very quickly, then you can suck a bunch of water in and including a fish or squid, and then kind of filter out the water and then swallow the fish or squid. And, and that's what it looks like the elephant seals are doing. And um, that matches what we kind of observe and have guessed because we see some older adult females um, that don't really have much in the way of teeth anymore. They're kind of worn down. And so they probably wouldn't be too effective at grabbing or manipulating prey, but yet they come back fat and healthy every year. So. Um, just more evidence that they're using that suction to feed. Um, we do not know a whole lot about the males and what they're feeding on. And the little that we do know is based on um, stomach lavage and um, scat analysis. But, but really, that's not a great way to study elephant seals. Um, it's a great way to study other species that are feeding locally. So for the California sea lions that are on the island behind me, um, using scat analysis is a great way to study them because they go off and feed very close and then come up on land and um, defecate on the island. And then we can look through their um, their scat to look at all the hard parts, you know, so the squid eyeballs and fish bones and fish ear bone otoliths and things like that to figure out the different species and quantities of prey that they're eating. But the elephant seals are feeding very far away from Ani Nuevo. And so most of them have been actually fasting for at least a week before they arrived here. And so they've passed most of their prey through their gut and, and there's not really much remaining. So if you do look through their, their feces or in their stomach, it, it is possible to get some indication of prey items in there, um, but it's probably not very representative of what they're eating out at sea. So it really does require a more careful look using cameras or fatty acid analysis or, or other approaches like that. And so we still, have, we still have a lot of work to do in those areas on these other demographics. Interesting, yeah, right. Yeah, it, oh, we have a seven-year-old Kate, Katie, um, who was asking about, you had mentioned this before, but just the, the depth that the elephant seals generally are swimming to. Yeah, absolutely. So again, it's with these um, time depth recorders um, that we've been able to um, document those amazing dives. So we attach those to literally hundreds of animals over the past 20 years. And we've been able to gain a lot of information about the averages and the maximums um, for the seals. And really both of those are amazing. So um, if we start off with the very young animals, so these weanlings, um, like the ones right in front of me, um, those start off diving as deep as about 200 to 300 meters. And I guess a lot of folks are usually um, used to thinking about um, the English system, so um, using feet, so I'll try to switch over to that. Um, so if we say that 200 uh, meters is maybe 600 feet in depth, so pretty darn deep right away. And then the adult females are diving on average to about, um, let's say, 1,500 feet. So that's pretty darn far. I mean, maybe about the size of a, a city block. <laughs> so just absolutely incredible depths. And then the males are probably not diving quite that deep because they're feeding mostly on the benthos or the bottom of the ocean, but not in the middle of the ocean, kind of along the shoreline um, on the continental shelf. So most of their dives are in the kind of 600 to 800 foot range. Um, but the adult females are going way out into the middle of the Northeast Pacific over very, very deep water, many miles in, deep, in depth. And they're going down to as deep as over a mile. So I, mean, I, I think I'm a pretty fast runner. When I run, I can run a mile in maybe seven minutes. 
And so I can't even imagine trying to run that distance while holding my breath. And by the way, running back a mile. So really traveling two miles, you know, down and back all in one breath. So just absolutely amazing. Um, and so, yeah, the depth is pretty amazing. And then the, the duration is also amazing. So the average dive duration of both males and females is about 23 minutes. But some of these guys are just blowing that out of the water and going as, as long as almost two hours in duration. So we're seeing just incredible physiology. And this one animal that went um, super deep and super long on, on her dive, I had the expectation when I was looking at that dive record for the first time, that if I kept on scrolling and looked at the next dive, that maybe she needed to recover after that dive. So if I look at um, other species like beaked whales or Waddell seals down in the Antarctic or California sea lions, if they do a really deep dive or really long dive, then they spend lots of time on the surface after that recovering from that. I know that you know when I try to hold my breath in a swimming pool for a long period of time, um, when I get up to the surface, I don't just go back underwater right away. I need to kind of recover for a little while. And so that was my expectation with the elephant seals. But it turns out that that seal that was down for nearly two hours spent two minutes at the surface and went back underwater for another hour long dive. So just absolutely amazing. So that tells me that these guys are not really pushing their limits on a regular basis. So they have an absolutely incredible physiology. You've got some interesting activity going over your shoulder. I'll, I'll save the rest of our questions. I know it, it, I think at the end, we we're gonna do some asking questions while, uh, and we can get to a number of these questions for those of you who've been waiting on questions. Thank you. Um, but it looks like we've got a lot of interesting things to see. I'm looking at this mail right over your shoulder. So we'll ask a lot more questions at the end and we'll kind of keep, we talked about keeping the camera out while we're doing that. So we can give people an opportunity to ask those questions then. So go ahead. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. And. Uh... So now is probably a great time before we start walking around here for me to mention um, how I'm out here right now. <laughs> so this this is not just me as a member of the public coming out to the elephant seal colony. Um, we actually had to get lots of special permission to be able to come out here and lots of layers of permitting um, to do this sort of work. So um, I'll just like quickly briefly run through that before we before you guys can help me out with some of these uh, research tasks here. Um, so. Uh, one of them is our federal research permit. So we have a permit with the National Marine Fisheries Service. Um, it takes about a year and a half to get one of these permits. It's very grueling. So um, you know, thanks to the researchers at UC Santa Cruz that went through that process to, to get that permit for all the different researchers who work out here. And so basically we have to detail all of the different things that we're going to do. That gets very heavily scrutinized by the National Marine Fisheries Service and the United States government's um, Marine Mammal Commission. And then if all goes well, they get permission to do that. And then we also have to get permission from the state park. Um, this is official state park land, so they oversee all the work that goes on here. And then also the universities um, that the research is done out of. So for example, University of California, Santa Cruz, or Sonoma State University, or Moss Landing Marine Labs, a lot of different universities around the world uh, come to do work here. So all of the individual universities, um, the researchers from them need to have permission from their universities. And specifically, they have an animal care and use committee um, at each of those universities that gives permission um, and basically oversees the welfare of the animals to be sure that um, we're doing everything appropriate in terms of the safety and welfare of the research animals and not doing anything that, that we shouldn't do. And, and there's members of the public on those committees and different researchers and veterinarians. And so there's, there's just a heavy degree of scrutiny over all the different research techniques. And that's both to keep researchers safe and the elephant seals safe so that we don't impact the very animals that we're trying to protect and study. And so I, I feel very confident that we're not having any sort of negative impact on the seals out here and just trying to study their natural behavior while bringing um, folks like you, all the different research findings that we have. So it is a, a really great partnership between all those different organizations. Okay, um, so enough of that kind of paperwork stuff. Um, so what we're gonna do now is actually walk around a little bit. Um, hopefully the tide continues to go down and my feet don't get wet here. Um, but we're gonna try to walk around and show you what it's like to record some of these um, basic data that, that we record on a daily basis. So. 
I mentioned that we're constantly going around looking for the flipper tags and to record basic demographic information. So you guys can help me um, at home there, fill out some basic information, um, like the flipper tag number, um, where in the position of the flipper the tag is located, the age and sex class of the animal, um, and the beach that we're finding that animal on. And so um, one thing before we get going is I can tell you a little bit about the um, flipper tag positions. And so if I kind of use my hand as an example here, if you look very carefully, um, pretend my hand was a web, but like an elephant scale flipper, um, I have four different places between my digits. So um, let's see, like there's this one and this one. So the two that are open right now, those are the inner webbings. And the two that are open right now are the outer webbings. And then we have the upper and the lower. So I'll describe this in more detail once we see an individual flipper tag, but we basically keep track of the inner and outer portions of the webbing. And if it's in the left or right flipper, in which direction of the spike of the tag. So we write down all of that, as well as the digits on the tag. And then the age, and if, if we can, determine the sex of the animal. Okay, so that's our task here. So we'll walk around and, and see if we can find any of those flipper tags in the rear flippers of the seals, or any die marks on the side of them. And so I'll have to flip my camera around, and I apologize in advance for all the bouncing around as I walk around, but um, hopefully that'll be okay. Okay, flipping the camera around. Okay, nice pile of weanlings here. Oh, I'm seeing, might be seeing one flipper tag in the middle there. That one's pretty hard to read. I'm not sure I can read that one. So this is pretty common being able to, to see a flipper tag but not be able to read it because it's kind of tucked too far into a group. So we try really hard not to disturb the animals they were working on. So I can't go in there. I'm also seeing a bleach mark on the side of that same individual. Um, but it's covered up by neighboring animals, so it can't really read that too well. Let's venture over here to this other group. Uh, not seeing any flipper tags or marks on those animals either. Okay. Venture over it over here. Ooh, I think I see a flipper tag here. You guys can help me read it. All right, I apologize, it might be a little bit windy for you guys. Okay, so you guys can put in the, if you put in the question, um, the question option there, if you can read the flipper tag, you can go ahead and write in what you see there. And while you guys are reading that, I'm trying to figure out the flipper tag position. So I'm seeing the belly of the seal here. So it's kind of on its left side. So that's actually its right flipper that we're seeing. And that flipper tag position is in the right outer upper position. And it looks like this animal is almost fully molted. It's molted off most of its lanugo. So you can see on its um, fore flipper there, right there, it has just a little bit of that kind of lighter, or sorry, a darker chocolatey brown fur, um, but mostly it has that nice silver fur. So it's mostly molted. So I would say this animal is 99% molted, and its tag is green H826 in the right outer upper position, 
and oh, we can determine its uh, sex right now as well. So because its belly is up like that, so let's see if I can point it out for you here. So that hole right there, um, that's its penile opening. And so that means it's a male. If it didn't have that, then it would be a female. Just for comparison, let's venture over to this animal over here, also showing her belly. So no penile opening on that seal. So that one's a female. And so we'd write down that flipper tag, its position, the fact that it's a weanling seal, the location on the beach here, this is what we call Tar Sands Beach. We have lots of little names for the different beaches around here. And then of course the date, so they can record that. And then all of that gets uploaded into our database so that we can hopefully find this animal again in the future. Okay, continuing on here. Ooh, this is actually a really interesting observation here. So I don't want to get too close to the adult females because they're still nursing their pups. But if I zoom in, let's see, you guys see anything interesting about this particular seal? If you look carefully on her head and on her back, she's carrying some instrumentation. So a team of researchers from Dr. Dan Costa's lab on this seal and chemically immobilized her um, a few days ago and attached a satellite tag on her head and it looks like a VHF tag on her back and so that will enable us to study her at sea movements and this is really neat this is one of those tags that I was mentioning studies the, um, the her body composition out at sea and so this is a really neat kind of experimental tag and if this works on her then it will be used on um, all sorts of marine mammals all over the world. And so that company has used these elephant seals um, as a way to test them. And so hopefully our seals here will kind of pave the way for researchers around the world to be able to study their species more easily. Let's see, I can't venture too far because I'll go out of my cell phone service area here, but um, we can actually see off in the distance there, there's a team of researchers. And they're the ones that are putting out the flipper tags in the seals. And you can see on the center of the screen now is a tripod, and that's actually how they weigh the, the weanlings. So in addition to receiving those um, flipper tags, we weigh and measure the seals, and that helps us understand their starting point in life, their, their health when they first start, their very first foraging migration. Jumping out of the way of the water here. <laughs> Definitely still high tide. <laughs> Ooh, and I'm just now noticing uh, we have an animal with a bleach mark over here. So that's a, a good example of one of the other types of data that we collect. So that weanling has a die mark that says A41. It's on the left side. I see a, a mark on the right that I can't quite read either. And this animal is partially molted, just starting to molt off that lanugo fur. And this is actually um, an example of a pretty exciting one. Um, we have different codes for the different um, types of weanlings. And this one has that particular mark on it because 
her mother was a known individual with a flipper tag. And so one of the really neat things that we can do um, with this demographic project, because the seals here tend to come back again and again to breed, um, is keep track of generations of seals. So for example, if we instrument a seal and determine that she's a really deep diver, um, and then we're curious if maybe her pups are also deep divers, maybe she transmits that deep diving gene um, to her pups, then we can study that because we keep track of you know, the mother and pup relationships uh, across generations like that. Um, we also do uh, put flipper tags in lots of random seals each year, but we try to find uh, follow these lineages of animals as well. So that one is a nice one because we can track that lineage. So that's um, just a quick little tour of what it's like being a, a researcher out here and collecting some basic demographic information. I'll spare you guys the boring part about entering all of that into our database. <laughs> Um, but yeah, well, a lot of what we do is just walking around and collecting those, those basic research information. Uh, I think now's probably a great time to answer some additional questions while I keep the camera focused on the seals for anyone who's interested in watching. That's great. Lots more questions. And this is great to be able to see, to see them as you're going. We've had a couple of people along the way in the Q&A section. Victoria made mention of the big, big male drama going on at one point. <laughs> see some moving along um one of the one of the questions that keeps popping up are natural they're natural predators and and someone was asking specifically with the growth of the of the great white shark population in monterey bay if that's having an impact on elephant seal populations and then also people are just curious what are the main predators of elephant seals yeah so the the predation question is a super interesting one and and one that we actually don't have a lot of answers for because it is so hard to study that. So the predation of an elephant seal, like of an individual is a very, very rare event. And it's one that happens underwater. So it's actually very, very hard to study. And we think that we have seen evidence of um, orcas or great white sharks attacking elephant seals. Um, there have been you know, a small number of direct observations by non-scientists usually, um, just like fishermen or you know, other people out in boats. Um, and then we also can see the scars and wounds on the sides of seals sometimes. And so uh, it can be quite horrific actually. Like sometimes we see seals haul out and they have giant chunks of blubber and muscle missing out of their side. And you know, sometimes it's very clear based on the a pattern of tissue that's missing that it was a, a larger animal with very sharp teeth that did it. And um, there are shark experts that look at those and can confirm with us that um, most often it's great white sharks that are doing that locally here. Um, so like I said, it's very hard to study that. Um, what we observe here is that there are a lot of weanlings born and then about half of them survive uh, and come back um, to make it to their first birthday. And we don't really know if it's starvation, predation, if they're going to other colonies um, that researchers aren't at, um, certainly some of them do, but we don't know exactly how many. So a lot of big questions there. Um, one interesting study approach that other researchers have used, um, I'm thinking about researchers who study stellar sea lions. Um, they do make an interesting tag that specifically addresses this question and it's called a life history tag. It's a little bit invasive, um, you actually have to surgically implant it into the abdominal cavity of the animal. And then when that animal dies of whatever cause, um, whether it's starvation or predation, um, the tag is eventually liberated from the body and floats up to the surface and then transmits information about the last you know, few weeks of life that that animal had in terms of its behavior and temperature environment. And we think that we can differentiate um, things like starvation from predation based on the speed of temperature change. And so that might be something that we could do in the future, but that, that's a pretty invasive project to do. And so I'm not sure we're going to do that in the near term here. So until then, um, we're just going to have to rely upon kind of these very indirect ways, like looking at the scars and wounds on, on sharks, or hopefully maybe eventually capturing some underwater footage of these interactions. 
I should mention that we do have other researchers um, working here at Ani Nuevo um, that are focused on the sharks. And so um, researchers from Stanford University down at Hopkins Marine Station, um, they're studying great white sharks. I'm thinking Barbara Block, and then also from the Monterey Bay Aquarium, like Salvador Jorgensen. Um, they're very interested in the great white sharks and they're studying those and tagging those and putting acoustic tags on them. They actually come to Ani Nuevo to study sharks. So this is a very sharky area. Um, they routinely observe great white sharks in the area just offshore of the island. So like literally just beyond the island, which is just right there, um, there you can routinely find sharks um, during much of the year. And so that's probably one of the reasons why the weanling seals don't venture very far before they actually start their first migration. It would be very risky for them to do that. Um, so we hope to form some collaborations with that team in the future to better understand that relationship. Probably the great white sharks are feeding mostly on the California sea lions because they're coming and going a lot. So the elephant seals are largely staying on shore or very near shore, whereas the California sea lions are actually going out to forage for numerous days and then coming back to shore. There's basically a lot more commuting going on there and a lot more opportunities for sharks to take them. So yeah, a long way of saying basically we don't know for sure, but we have some evidence that larger predators like orcas and, and great whites are taking elephant seals, but the extent to which is just very unknown. It's a great question. As we're seeing, you know, the seals moving and coming to and fro, how fast can these elephant seals move on land? Yeah, so most of the time they're moving very, very slowly and just sort of slowly lumbering around. Um, it's mostly when we see the male-male interactions. So when we see a subordinate male being chased by a dominant male, um, the dominant male is very interested in getting to that subordinate male as soon as he can. And so we, that's when we see the, the fastest motions. And over short distances, that can be about the same speed that I can run. So that's pretty fast, um, but they can't really maintain that for very much time. Um, they get overheated and tired very quickly. They're not very efficient at moving on land, certainly much more efficient at swimming underwater. So you know, as a researcher walking around here, I do have to be very careful because over short distances, they can move very quickly. But if I'm very careful, and I always keep a buddy with me that helps observe the seals, so um, if one does decide to run towards me, then I can get out of the way very quickly and, and not, you know, it won't be a problem. More often than not, the seals, when they are moving quickly, like I said, are going after other seals. So as long as we kind of get out of the way, then we can be safe. It's very rare for a seal to kind of charge a human, for example. When they're communicating, do they communicate underwater as well? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so many species of marine mammals do communicate underwater, and we know that because they vocalize a lot and we can record those. And researchers have looked at like humpback whales and you know the songs that they produce, and you know that's um, you know sort of a, a mating um, call that they do. And other researchers look at echolocation. You know, it's not just not just communication, but also exploring their environment with sound. You know, they can create sound and bounce it off of objects in order to basically see farther than they can um, just in the visual realm. And so, a lot of folks have been interested in whether pinnipeds in general utilize sound underwater um, for either of those purposes. And the short answer is we think that they don't, which is actually fairly surprising. Um, so we have attached acoustic tags to elephant seals to see if they make sounds when they're out at sea foraging, potentially interacting with other seals. And despite the fact that like the animal behind me here is making a lot of noise, um, despite the fact that they make a lot of noise on land, we have seen no evidence that they're making sound underwater at all. And, and that's for either of those purposes, either for communication within species or um, to explore their environment. Um, so certainly we need to do more study in that regard, but yeah, we've seen no evidence that they're vocalizing at all underwater. And one of the reasons might be is because they're feeding, we think, in a largely solitary way. So if you, if you look at an animal like a humpback whale, um, some of those guys will feed cooperatively. I'm sure that you guys have seen all of the 
the BBC documentaries and you know, Planet Earth um, uh, movies that, that showed us this amazing footage of bubble net feeding and things like that. And in order to have multiple whales feed in synchrony, they need to coordinate their efforts, even in murky water. And they can do that by um, calling and, and basically talking to each other. And we see no evidence that elephant seals are cooperatively feeding. So it could just be that there's been no need over evolutionary time for these guys to develop uh, a way to communicate underwater. But yeah, something that we definitely need to study more. It's a great question. And on land, like with the level of complexity, you mentioned earlier about the, the females often getting getting confused with which is their pup. Um, and in sort of arguing about that between each other, but the let sort of, can you talk to the their complexity of language when they're on land? Yeah, so it's it's very basic. So yeah, calling it a language is very generous. <laughs> it's probably <laughs> just a, a few different types of calls each. Yeah. Um, the the most apt sort of analogy that I've heard, and this is uh, uh, Dr. Carolyn Casey, who does a lot of the acoustics research. Um, so the males that are vocalizing. Um, she says that the calls that they make are kind of like them saying their own name. So, like, my name is Patrick, and so if I were a, a male elephant seal, then I would just go along the beach, and I would occasionally yell out, Patrick, Patrick, and then all of the other seals would know that Patrick is there. And then there would be another seal that says, Sam, Sam, and then all the seals would know that Sam is there. Now, just because I know that Sam is nearby, doesn't necessarily um, tell me if I'm dominant to Sam or subordinate to Sam. So sometimes we might kind of talk to each other by me saying my name and, and Sam saying his name, and then, then we might interact. But if he beat me in a fight, then I would remember that Sam is more dominant than me. So I would know to stay out of his way in the future. So in the future, if I ever heard Sam, I would run away in fear, basically. And so that's kind of the level of their communication. And likewise with the mother and pup, um, you know, the mothers, we think, make a slightly unique sound and the pups make a slightly unique sound. Not perfectly unique because they get confused a lot, but it's enough that the mothers and pups can more often than not recognize each other. Um, but it's basically just saying their name. You know, like, I'm the mother, I'm the daughter, I'm the mother, I'm the daughter. Okay, then we belong together, that's great. Um, but it's not any sort of conversation conversation beyond that. Yeah, so with the with mothers and, and, and the weanlings, is there, if a mother is injured, is there some sort of community share on caring for the pups? Yeah, so if you were to walk through a harem in the middle of the breeding season, um, the vast majority of the females would each have one pup and they would be protective of that one pup and you know, be nursing it and, and trying to raise it to, to normal weanling weight. Um, you of course see a mix of mothers that have not yet given birth um, and females that have given birth. So we do see a variety of, you know, it's not like a perfect match between mothers and pups. Um, certainly, females do have issues with their pregnancies sometimes. So some mothers will um, lose their pregnancy out at sea or um, have a stillborn uh, pup on the beach. And then others, um, especially during high tide or high swell events, um, if the mother has decided to have her pup very near the high tide line, then during one of these events, the pup might get washed away uh, into the water and die, or maybe just get washed away and just kind of move down the beach a little ways out of the view of the female. And so there can be separation events like that. We also see um, mothers who just adopt other pups. And so um, earlier this season, I saw a particular adult female that had six different pups around her. And we know for sure that she didn't um, give birth to all of those pups. Maybe just one of those was hers. Um, but she's not um, actively dissuading the other pups from trying to nurse off of her. And so that is maladaptive for her. Like it would be better for her to focus on her pup and give all of her energy to that one pup. Um, but some mothers, usually the young ones, just kind of haven't figured that, that out yet and are not super proprietary about their resources yet. And the unfortunate thing about that is that in order for a weanling to survive its first year of life, it really does need to 
kind of get a full dose of milk, like a, a full 27 days of nursing. And so when we see these females that have many pups that are suckling off them, probably none of them are going to survive that first year of life. So it really is quite a sad thing to know that many of those are not going to survive. So it's in a sense, it's like nice that the mothers are sharing their milk, but this might be a case when sharing is not the best thing for everyone involved. <laughs> yeah. Um, when you were talking about dates a bit a bit ago, you were what what was the year? People were, a couple of folks were asking for uh, the year when the seals almost went extinct when they were down to twenty. Yeah, so that was um, the late eighteen hundreds and early nineteen hundreds. They they were actually sort of declared extinct on several different occasions. Um, so yeah, I'm forgetting right now the exact year of the the expedition. I believe it was the Smithsonian. Um, expedition that went down there um, to find like the last remaining elephant seals. Um, but certainly, you know, 120 years ago was about the time period that that, that population bottleneck happened. And of course, um, it probably didn't grow, the population didn't grow very quickly immediately. So it was probably at that very low level for, you know, a few generations before enough individuals were present to, to really grow the population in meaningful ways. But yeah, it has been it's incredible to think that just really not too long ago, this population was effectively extinct, and then now they're at really healthy population numbers. And it just really hits home with respect to what a protected area can do. So just by protecting these animals, not through any active conservation, just literally not killing them, these guys have been able to rebound to amazing numbers. So. Um, so just to give a plug to the land trust here, you know, by areas that are protected, whether through the land trust or through the state park system or through the national park system or through the UC natural reserve system, all of these areas that are protected might be serving in these very important capacities for species that we don't even know about yet. I mean, there's microbes all the way up to whales and elephant seals. And it's just really important to protect these whole ecosystems for future generations. Thank you. Yes, such an important, so important to have said. Yeah. Um, can you speak also to the 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 male anatomy that people are interested about the proboscis? If you could talk a little bit about function and the form of that. Yeah. So um, one of the fun things about elephant seals is how sexually dimorphic they are. So that basically means that there is a a big difference between the males and females. And um, interestingly, for some pinnipeds, for, you know, for some species of seals, like the Waddell seal, the females are actually larger than the males. So you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be that the males are larger. Um, but in elephant seals, the males are much, much larger. I should say the adult males are much, much larger than the adult females. Um, and that extends to several different parts of their anatomy. So their overall body size and their nose or proboscis. And so um, this guy in front of me here is uh, showing off his nose. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of people ask, like, what is the purpose of this nose? I mean, it's really, it's really the name of the elephant seal. They're named after that long nose. You know, does it serve some sort of important purpose? And as far as we can tell, um, there's really not a, a very important purpose other than it is a secondary sexual characteristic. So... This is probably something where when males are interacting with each other and establishing their dominance hierarchies, um, this is uh, basically a tool that they use to advertise to other males that they are a big bad male and to not mess with them. It's not worth fighting with me because I am a giant male. Um, so if, if I was a male elephant seal, I would not be able to weigh myself or look at myself in the mirror. So I don't really know how big I am. I just know um, how successful I've been in other fights um, based on how other animals look. And so if I, if I see a big male and I think he's bigger than me, then I'm going to be scared. And so that giant chest shield, their ability to stand up very tall um, and a giant nose, you know, are all probably factors that play into um, being very, giving the appearance of being very dominant. And so you know, if I'm a male, my single priority in life is to reproduce. And the way that I gain access to females to reproduce is by being very large 
and maintaining a high spot in the dominance hierarchy and fending off subordinate males. So big body size, big nose, being able to stand up very tall and being a good fighter you know, are all features that will help me in future generations. And if you think about it, a lot of males never um, become the alpha male of a harem and, and they don't get breeding opportunities. And those genes are immediately eliminated from the population. And these guys, because the male mates with you know, maybe 50 different females in a harem, his genes are disproportionately um, given to the next generation. So if he has some sort of feature, you know, he's a little bit larger, he's a little bit meaner, you know, whatever it is, um, that gives him the advantage, all of a sudden his genes are in a large number of the pups of the next generation. So you can see how that can snowball very quickly. And it's something that we call runaway sexual selection. When, when these things kind of run away through time like that, like bigger is better, and therefore they get bigger and bigger <laughs> through time. So there probably is some sort of upper size limit. You know, as you get too large, you know, it becomes difficult to move around on land. You have to feed more when you're out at sea. So there's probably an upper size limit. Um, so it would be very interesting to track the weight of males, big adult males through time and see if over evolutionary time, they're actually continuing to grow or not, or maybe they've reached their kind of maximum size. Right, and it seems like that, sort of that mounted on top of the uh, the bottle the bottleneck when the, in the population got so low just sort of a lack of genetic diversity can you hear me okay uh sorry i think you cut out there for a second oh, sorry. Can you so no, just just in terms of, could you speak to that too? I mean, so so that, but also when you were talking about, you know, the population going so low, and I guess this was before you were really charting things at this point, but sort of that lack of genetic diversity after that bottleneck, and then you're, you know, compounded on that are all are such a selected gene pool. Can you hear me okay? <laughs> I think you cut out again right at the last. <laughs> I think that um, so the lack of. Maybe I'll start with this. I'll start with a couple simple questions because. Um, yeah. But the uh, so, how many how many seals are around you on the beach there? Yeah, so uh, we have maybe um, twenty weanlings down here in front of me, and then um, you know maybe another forty or so over here, and then we have a few small harems of females remaining. So. Um, you know, in total, probably, I've had to venture a guess, there's probably about 300 adult females remaining here, and all of them have a little pup, or actually a large pup next to them at this point, because they're about to wean. And then we have a bunch of different fe uh, uh, males around that are all trying to um, take advantage of the opportunities to mate with the, the females before they take off. So, you know, all told, um, you know, there are probably, including all of the weanlings that are here, a few thousand um, individuals at Onion Nuevo if you go all across the beaches here and out to the island. Um, let's see, so um, have you, how about using the data for, the data that you've been collecting for the, you know, the influence of global warming? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so th this is a, a really important question. Um, you know, so with the study of elephant seals, we sort of have the ability to address lots and lots of different questions and study them in ways that we can't study other creatures um, because they're so accessible to us. So um, this is one of the things I kind of like to joke about with our southern elephant seal colleagues. So a researcher that works on southern elephant seals um, has to you know, fly in a plane to go down to maybe South America they get on a boat and travel for a week to go out to one of these South Antarctic islands. And then, then they have to spend like a month or in some cases a year out on this remote field site in order to study these animals. And here at Año Nuevo, we can just roll out of bed in the morning, drive up the road a half hour and be at this amazing research site. And that allows us to do some really important studies that would be impossible to do at other sites and address questions related to climate change or, or other aspects that, that just are impossible at other sites or with other species. 
and this is in particularly important when we think about the impact of climate change or other human impacts on other species that are much more difficult to study, like beaked whales. Even just seeing a beaked whale is very challenging, but these elephant seals are feeding in some of the same areas as beaked whales. And so if we study the elephant seals, we can get a little glimpse into the health of the ecosystem that they're relying upon and that possibly the beaked whales are relying upon as well. So a lot of the work that we do is sort of in the mindset of being able to better understand the impacts that climate change is going to have on elephant seals, but also trying to understand the, the larger ecosystem. And so a lot of these are indirect links. So it's not kind of the best way to do science, but it's the tool that we have available to us right now. We can't really do controlled experiments with global climate change um, because that would be impossible. So we have to just use the available bits of information that we have and so one of those um, really interesting bits of information um, is utilizing the annual variability um, in our climate. And so one of the things like the El Nino and La Nina cycles, or you guys may have heard of the warm water blob event of the North Pacific um, a few years back. So these are very interesting, large scale, in some cases, a global phenomena that happen and affects the oceans and productivity in the oceans. And they do impact some marine mammal species very profoundly, like California sea lions are very impacted by El Nino events in many cases, and were horribly affected by the, the warm water blob event because it impacted their prey items. Um, but elephant seals actually did quite well. They were able to adapt their behavior. Um, and in many cases, we're feeding right in the middle of this warm water blob event, um, and we're still doing fine. And we think that what's going on there is that they're reliant upon a much more stable prey resource um, than let's say California sea lions. I really like the comparison with California sea lions because both elephant seals and California sea lions exist right here at Año Nuevo, but they're so different in so many ways. So the California sea lions are feeding all along the coast. And if we don't have good upwelling in a given year, then that affects the phytoplankton, it affects the lower food chain, and then eventually impacts the ability of the California sea lions to feed. As far as we can tell, these relatively large annual climate events do not have the same impact to elephant seals. And so the elephant seals might need to shift where they go a little bit, but there's still a really great prey resource out for them, even in these sort of bizarre years. So that might be an indication that elephant seals and other species that feed in deep water in the middle of the Northeast Pacific, or perhaps in deep water of the other oceans, um, will actually be able to mitigate some of the um, potential downsides of climate change. And we had one researcher from the NOAA lab down in Monterey um, who did a modeling paper. So uh, basically utilizing some of the diving and tracking data from elephant seals and a variety of other species and looking at the ocean models that exist, so very complex, fancy models of future predictions of the ocean circulation. And he basically looked at the likely foraging area of elephant seals and other species uh, in future climate change scenarios. And from that, he was able to show that you know, many species, their foraging range will decrease and that will likely decrease the population of those species, but elephant seals, are just going to shift a little bit and actually probably will not impact them too much. So they might actually be a climate change winner. And some of our collaborators who work on the southern elephant seals off the Antarctica, um, off the Antarctic coast, um, have come to similar conclusions that um, climate change might actually open up some areas for them to forage down there. Now, this will be bad for many species, but it might actually benefit elephant seals. So we're learning some very interesting nuances to the climate change story. So I'm certainly not an advocate of climate change. It's, it's not good what we're doing to our planet, but understanding the nuance of what happens to certain species uh, can help us focus our efforts um, when these changes do start to happen. So in the future, maybe it'll be important to put more conservation efforts into protecting California sea lions than it will elephant seals. Yeah. Um, what's the average size of the of the male, male versus female, and weight? Yeah. So uh, it's it's actually funny how we know about the the mass of the different animals. So 
the female seals, we can actually do a direct mass measurement. And we do this routinely when we attach or remove those satellite tags and time depth recorders to the seals. And so we, uh, with that same tripod that I was showing you guys earlier, um, we can actually roll the seal into a giant, like 10 foot long sling, and then attach that to a come along and a hanging scale that's connected to the top of the tripod. And with a come along, we can basically, um, with my full strength, <laughs> crank the animal into the air a little bit and weigh the seal. And we can do that with adult females. And the average is about 450 kilograms. So just under, you know, right around a thousand pounds. Um, and that, that ranges quite a bit. So um, at the end of the molt season, um, they might weigh as little as 500 pounds. And at the very beginning of the breeding season when they're fresh um, back after that long migration and at their fattest in the, in the year they can actually be you know more than double that so um you know closer to 1400 pounds so they, they undergo a dramatic change in mass throughout the year and then the males they are just too large for us to be able to weigh using um, those kind of direct methods like that um you know with a with a hanging scale like that so researchers had to be pretty clever and this was before my time, so unfortunately I wasn't able to witness this directly, but um, what they used to do was put um, giant platform scales on the sand, and they would have to use at least two of them because the seals are so large. And then, okay, like how do you get a giant male to a giant platform scale? We don't want to move on to those. So they had to lure the animal over um, with a model of a female elephant seal. So they had to kind of pretend like there was a female who wanted to be mated with and lure the male over. And then they stopped the male right as it was on the scale and they get a quick measurement. And they even had to build little wings on the side of that scale in order to um, you know, contain the entirety of the animal so that it wasn't kind of spilling over on the side. And so from those measurements, we were able to show that um, the males um, can be upwards of about two tons in size. So kind of the big alpha males that we're seeing are, are about two tons at their maximum. So um, both the males and females are large, but the males are just absolutely gargantuan. Thanks. Okay, listen, we're we're running low on time and we're, a few of us are typing away at questions and asking questions and we're so sorry for all the ones we were not able to get to today. There's so many good questions. Um, I wanted to leave you before um, before we take off. Um, a couple of people were just asking and, and the number enough that I want to ask um, if what the differences have been now because there are no visitors. Um, and then also someone was asking, you know, what beaches just to be really clear about what is open and what is closed right now. So I guess both of those, what is open and what is closed right now? And then also what is the, what is that? How has that influenced the seal populations? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll start off with the, the what's open right now. Um, so yeah, unfortunately because of COVID, um, the, the preserve, which is the area where most of the elephant seals are, um, is closed unfortunately. So normally in a normal year, you'd be able to sign up for one of these um, docent led tours and go into groups of about 20 people out, um, you know, very close to the seals, which are great. So I recommend that as soon as they open those up, you know, probably next year, you know, you, everyone should sign up for one of those. Those are amazing. And if you do that, I recommend coming during um, basically the first week of February. Um, that's probably the best time to come out and see the most animals. Um, so then, so that area is closed right now, unfortunately. Um, but there are portions of the park that are open. So if you drive to Ani Nuevo State Park and you park in the main visitor lot, they, you can walk along the public trail uh, about halfway out to the point. And you can walk down onto the beach. It's called Cove Beach. And they have docents down there that are kind of monitoring. Uh, I think there are a couple of elephant seals down there on most days. And, and they've kind of monitored that to be sure that people don't get too close to them. So on some days, this just depends on the movement of the animals. On some days, the seals are actually blocking the little stairway down to the beach. And if that's happening, then they have to close the beach down. Uh, but on most days, you can go down there and, and explore the beach and, and see some elephant seals. Um, so yeah, that, that area is open to the public. And then, um, yeah, how does, how does the lack of visitation impact the seal distribution? Um, because of COVID and everything this year. And the, the quick answer is, as far as I can tell, it really hasn't changed things very much. 
Um, in a normal year, those docent-led tours that I mentioned, um, they're very, very careful to navigate around the elephant seals and not disturb them at all. And so um, we do see during the breeding season animals going pretty far inland. I mean, in some cases up to a kilometer inland. Um, mo but, you know, a bunch of animals, you know, just right around where the public trails are. And that's the main reason why they have those docent-led tours is to keep people safe. And so they don't just accidentally, you know, get too close to a seal and get injured. And so we see that same behavior this year. So some of the seals are venturing um, inland along those trails, um, but it's not an abnormal number. And so um, that actually is really exciting for me because that means that even in a normal year when we have, you know, potentially tens of thousands of public visitors coming through, that the seals are behaving in a very similar way. So despite all that visitation, we're not having a negative influence on, on these animals. So that's great for the seals and great for the visitors that we can kind of share this amazing resource with everyone and not have an impact. Thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Robinson. We really appreciate you being here to share this tour with us and also to share so much information. I know that people are came here with all different backgrounds and understanding, boy, it came, it came, we'll come out of this with a lot. Um, and for those of you who are not able to see all of this or would like to share this, we're gonna be sending them, those of you who have registered for this event, you will be receiving an email. So you'll get to see if you wanna look back at this or there are questions or things you, you knew you missed, um, you'll get a, a copy of the recording and um, the recording will be up on our website on Monday. So share your um, email too, pass it along so people can have this opportunity because this is a really great gift for us, especially since this has been closed and we haven't been able to do this. So what a gift this is from Patrick Robinson to be able to do this. So make sure next year when you can get back in person to get back in person and to be thoughtful about um, just as just as Patrick was saying about being really thoughtful about preservation and, and you can do that in a number of ways also through the Coastside Land Trust, you know, donating to help um, the preservation of open space is is critical as, as now as, as ever. Um, and so please do um, hop on to uh, our website, check out Anya Nuevo first week of February next next year for sure. Um, set your calendars. We'll, we'll all be racing for that. But thank you again so much. We really appreciate your time. Yeah, of course. Uh, thanks, everyone, for watching. Take care. All right. Bye-bye.